of 2016. I'm coming in a little bit early just because we do have a jam-packed session today and I want us to probably start at 3 o'clock so everybody has their fair share. So um, what I'm going to do is just double check to see, I know we still have some attendees um, signing on here, so we'll give them just a couple of seconds more, but I am then going to turn it over to our moderator for today, um, Shelly Thompson, and she will walk us through all of the fun things that um, we will be doing today. So, um, Shelly, over to you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Okay, we have a packed schedule today, um, and what we're going to start with are uh, updates on COSA activities, and those are going to be brought to you by um, members of the COSA board. And so, Matt Blessing from Wisconsin, the COSA president, is going to be giving us a COSA update on activities that are happening. Steve Murray from Alabama is going to talk to us about um, the finances in COSA. Sarah um, Coots from North Carolina is going to be talking about advocacy. Um, Mike Strom from Wyoming is going to be talking about all the activities going on with Siri. Uh, John Dugan from Missouri will be talking about the awards and what's happening there and um, some deadlines you need to be aware of. And Trisha Smith-Mansfield will be talking about um, development activities. And then I'll be filling you in on what's going on with the program committee. So let's start it off with Matt talking about COSA and all the things that are going on. Matt, Thank you, Shelley. Can I be heard? Yes. Okay, excellent. I was worried about technical problems, so that's uh, a great relief. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, you may recall that in Austin, the COSA leadership to uh, pledged to continue their efforts to keep all members abreast of the organization's many activities. And I asked Ann Ackerson to please pay special attention to those uh, organizational communication initiatives this year, and I just want to commend Ann for her hard work uh, so far. So this is sort of almost a mid-year uh, work group meeting for COSA, and I'm very pleased to have a majority of the COSA board members providing updates and participating in this webinar today. Uh, as Shelley mentioned, we have our vice president and President-elect Tricia Smith-Mansfield from Utah uh, on the line, in addition to our treasurer, Steve Murray from Alabama, our immediate past president and current board member and chair of the Advocacy Committee, Sarah Kuntz from North Carolina, Mike Strom will be reporting on the State Electronic Records Initiative, what we're calling 3.0. And of course, Mike is from Wyoming. Uh, John Dugan, board member, uh, State Archivist of Missouri, will be reporting on the awards committee. Uh, then, then we'll have Shelley uh, and her good work in organizing the program committee and specifically the webinars. So I think that will take about 35 or 40 minutes. Then we'll pause as we always do. There are some folks online that might have state procurement issues, but we want to uh, give a big thanks to Ancestry and for their long-term support of COSA. And we're joined by Jared Ackerhead and Brian Peterson for the last part of the webinar. I just want to touch on four items. Uh, again, going back to our effort to really keep members informed of communication. About a month ago, we launched the new COSA website, which also includes the PERTS portal and the vendor contract for the development of the website 
has been completed. They were very responsive, uh, an excellent group to work with. And I think we've moved at this point from the kicking the tires stage to the new car warranty stage. Um, we've had some good feedback, but not a lot of it. And so I would, in, and I, I realize a lot of you on the line have very, very busy schedules, but I have a request and that is to go home tonight or this weekend and uh, try it out and please send Ann Ackerson any feedback. Uh, if you can find any flaws, please let us know because of course the website is such a vital part of our communication efforts. Second, uh, again, I wanna thank Ann for the newsletters that have been prepared so far this year and the care and attention that she's put into them. She sent out a new newsletter about a week ago. So if you did not receive it, maybe you've got too strong of a spam filter, uh, please let Ann know because it's filled with a lot of really good content. Uh, third, I don't think I'm letting the cat out of the bag too quickly, but the COSA board had a telephone conference call yesterday and agreed that we would be going to Boise, Idaho in the summer of 2017 for a joint meeting with Nagara. So I think by my reckoning, this is the first time that we'll be back in the Rocky Mountain states since the 2012 Santa Fe meeting. So we look forward uh, to going back to Boise and I'm sure Patricia Smith Mansfield will enjoy the quick drive up from Utah as president that year. And finally, uh, the COSA board is getting ready for its annual mid-year board meeting in Washington, D.C. We'll be meeting at the National Archives, uh, appointments with folks like David Ferriero, and I would encourage, ask any of you that have any concerns uh, or questions about COSA to send me an email at matt.blessing at wisconsinhistory.org. Uh, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, if, if you have any concerns or suggestions for agenda items at that meeting, and I'll make sure it gets on the agenda. So with that, I'll turn it back to Shelley. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, next up, we have Steve Murray, who's gonna fill us in on uh, activities of the finance. Steve, are you there? Thank you. I am, thank you, Shelley, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking, thanking uh, my fellow members of the Finance Committee, who include Eric Emerson of South Carolina, Michael Strom of Wyoming, and Jack Warner of Massachusetts. They're a fantastic uh, committee of people who give very thoughtful attention to COSA's resources, and also thank Ann uh, Ackerson, our Executive Director, for her careful stewardship as well. You've got before you a slide regarding our 2015 and 2016 year budgets. A number that is not on that screen, but I, I should mention, uh, are the total assets of our organization, which at 12-31-15 totaled $154,216. Uh, the, the financial health of our organization is good. Uh, the numbers that you see on the screen this afternoon are uh, part of some work that the Finance Committee and Ann have been doing to try to get a really good idea of what the basic op requirements are for the operations of, of COSA. Uh, we we are, have been very fortunate um, for the past several years to have worked with uh, federal funding received through various grants to, to support the programming of COSA, and that has brought with it some income uh, to support general operations and administrative uh, processes. But the, we're also kind of looking at the operational budget within the larger uh, financial operations of, of COSA. So the numbers you see for that reason do not include any federal grant dollars. These are all other basic operations uh, performed by COSA. And you can see that we've, uh, our 2016 budget has some 
projected growth in on the income side, and we're showing you there four primary income categories of membership, and we are still predominantly reliant on membership dues from the various states. But we've made some great uh, gains in the past few years in, in uh, seeking and receiving corporate sponsorship that uh, has reached up into the sixty to seventy thousand dollar range, and our development committee is always looking at ways to try to increase that. Uh, a, a topic that we've discussed um, increasingly is earned income and different ways that we can bring in new revenue streams to the organization. And then uh, we've had some very generous members who have responded both to our mid-year and end-of-year solicitations for donations. We had a very strong year in 2015. That figure of $7,064 was well above what we had budgeted. And so we actually increased the, the $5,000 figure as an increase from what we had projected for 2015. So we hope to uh, continue that, that, that trend as well. On the expense side, you've got five general categories, and when we have more time at the annual meeting, we'll go into more detail on what uh, is what makes up each of these. But generally speaking, program includes project management, uh, our website, annual meeting travel, uh, product development, and the staffing that is required to support all of those functions. Our advocacy section includes awareness education and related travel for uh, ad, for mem our board members and for our executive director who make trips to D.C. Uh, sometime throughout the year to, to speak to um, funders and, and other partners of ours, allied organizations. Our research and information sharing includes things like our archives and records management survey that provides extremely valuable information to, to the membership. There are staffing uh, assignments that go along with that, so a portion of their uh, costs are associated with that category line. And then our network building includes things like our awards program and, and uh, working with other organizations. Again, some of that is, is a portion of uh, our staff's time that goes to support that effort. Administration are all those leftover things, including office space, financial services, insurance, supplies, et cetera, and you can see uh, where our total is, uh, the 2016 budget was approved by the Board of Directors back in December, and so those are the numbers that we will be working with uh, moving forward. The, you see a figure there, transfer to endowment of $6,500 for 2016. That is a percentage of our sponsorships that are, by our bylaws, directed to a reserve fund that is now being managed by a professional investment account manager. That was a step that we took last summer uh, that's going to be good for us in the long run. We're riding through a, a bit of a rocky patch here in the stock market along with everybody else in the world, but we look forward to seeing how that uh, performs moving forward and the, the, the Finance Committee and Board of Trustees are monitoring those assets very carefully. And when we get to the Q&A later, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks, Steve. Next up, we have Sarah Kuntz from North Carolina, who's going to talk to us about the Advocacy Committee. Sarah, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, thank you. Um, and as she said, I'm the advocacy uh, rep from the board. Uh, the, the committee is actually chaired by, by Jim Corridan. And I would note uh, for your information that Jim also serves on the Joint Advocacy Committee with members of SAA and NAGARA as well. And we found that that's really a productive way to discuss common issues uh, among all three groups and ways that we can move together on joint actions. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, but basically some highlights of our activities that are coming up for 2016. As always, we, the committee will assist with planning the mid-year briefing in D.C. Um, and, and the messaging around that. Uh, we will continue working on our contacts and planning advocacy visits. Um, hopefully some will be around the time that the, the board is in D.C. as well, if not other times. 
Um, and as, as uh, Steve just mentioned, there is money in the budget for advocacy uh, visits so that we can make those necessary trips to Capitol Hill to continue uh, talking with members there. Um, I would encourage members, though, on a personal basis to continue their ongoing messaging about the importance of NHPRC and their role with the SHRABs and um, throughout the states. Um, it's not just an advocacy committee responsibility. It's, and, and with Congress, we find that it's just a continuous process where you have to keep pushing that message. So um, make sure when you're in touch with your uh, representatives and your senators that you, that you uh, highlight that message as well. Another important activity of the Advocacy Committee of late has been to review the NHPRC uh, draft strategic plans. They're in their second version, and the, the committee uh, reviews the, the drafts and makes some comments, forwards that to the board for their review and passing on to NHPRC. And I would, again, encourage you individually to make comments. That comment period for the second round doesn't close until Monday, I believe, so make sure you submit any uh, individual comments that you have as well on their draft strategic plan. Um, we, were, we were very excited to read the most recent version of it. I think there's some really, really good things in there. I mentioned a few minutes ago that we are working within the Joint Advocacy Committee with SAA and NAGARA. Um, most recently, the activity of that joint committee has been to develop a joint statement on access to government archives. This statement is still in draft form, but it's, it's pretty final draft form, so I would expect that fairly shortly the, the respective boards will have it for action. Uh, while this is a general statement about um, principles and um, what we think are best practices in terms of access to government records, we're also hopeful that can be useful in specific situations where access to government records on a state or local level might be threatened. Um, but that's, that's going to be coming out of the, the Joint Advocacy Committee um, fairly soon, the, the final version of that. So be on the lookout for that when that's um, published. And um, finally, uh, Jim has been working uh, with the National Coalition for History, and um, we just recently uh, received word that we will, COSA at large, will have a seat on their board. I believe SAA also participates on the board, so that'll be a great uh, second opportunity for us to do joint work with other stakeholder groups in, in furthering the advocacy message. So look for more information on that as we know the details of, of that, but we're very excited that we will be able to participate with them on that um, board. And that sums up the advocacy, what's on deck for 2016. Thanks, Sarah. Up next, we have Mike Strom from Wyoming to talk about Siri. Mike, are you there? I am. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, the, the Siri team is uh, preparing a new grant proposal for IMLS. Uh, this grant follows up on another IMLS grant, the ACCESS Planning Grant. Uh, ACCESS is an acronym in this case, and it stands for Archives Collaborating and Cooperating with External Strategic uh, Stakeholders. Those who worked on the ACCESS grant uh, produced an action plan, and we have selected a few activities listed on the to-do list in that plan as things to focus on with this grant. Those activities include uh, producing publications and guidelines aimed at electronic records creators, issuing reports, case studies, and generally uh, facilitating connections with external stakeholder groups, and creating and distributing governance models and standards to assist uh, COSA members. Cooperating and collaborating with external stakeholders is really important to this grant, and we are very pleased that NACIO, the National Association of State uh, Chief Information Officers, and NAS, the National Association of Secretary of State, and COSLA, the Chief Officers of State Library Agencies, have shown a willingness to work with us on this grant, and we hope to reach out to a few more uh, different external stakeholders once we get going on the grant. If approved, and we are still very early on, this is a preliminary proposal that we're preparing right now, but if approved, the grant would start around uh, November 1st and last for two years. And we're still working out the finances, but it appears that the grant will be approximately $125,000 to $150,000 over that two-year period. I, I've mentioned the access uh, action plan a few times here, and if you would like to uh, find it, you can do so on the uh, COSA website. Uh, click on the Programs tab at the top of the COSA homepage, then select State Electronic Records Initiative, and you will see the link toward the bottom of that page. 
Continuing education opportunities, uh, we have received an extension to the Laura Bush IMLS grant so that we can spend the remainder of the student support money. We will uh, use this money for activities already uh, undertaken in the grant, namely continuing education opportunities for uh, staff and their institutions. Uh, based on composite scores for self-assessment, we are giving states and territories access to additional scholarship and uh, AIM uh, webinars. Uh, watch for emails and postings to the listservs for more information, and please feel free to contact Sarah, Sarah, and Beth with questions. The uh, series subcommittees, uh, for the most part, the subcommittees are still getting situated. However, the education and uh, programming the subcommittee had to hit the ground running as they're the ones managing the scholarship funds I just mentioned. And uh, they are getting ready to kick off the next round of COSA Preservica Practical Digital Preservation Webinars with the next one hour webinar on automating email archiving and preservation scheduled for February 23rd. And the next two day workshops on um, March 8th and March 15th. While um, they are always working on providing relevant educational opportunities uh, for COSA members. They are currently in the planning process for creating the framework for establishing the affinity groups that will allow states uh, to collaborate online around specific issues related to long-term access of states' electronic records. Uh, they tell me that they have plenty of returning members to their committee, which is outstanding, uh, but they're always happy uh, to accept more if you would like to join. Advocacy and outreach, uh, Kathleen and Christine tell me that they are um, certainly uh, willing to uh, accept um, new members and asked me uh, to invite people to contact them if you're interested. Uh, the, uh, this subcommittee, I think, will be, I think all three of them will be very important, of course, in the next year, but certainly uh, looking at the focus of the new IMLS grant, there's lots of opportunities for this subcommittee to be involved. And, their charges include developing and distributing a state of the state e-records report, uh, managing and, and fostering relationships with SAA and NAGARA and NHPRC, and highlighting and promoting the work of state um, electronic records programs. Uh, there's lots of uh, work still to be done in developing and promoting social media campaigns around specific events and dates, and I'm sure one of those days will be Electronic Records Day. Tools and resources. Uh, they also asked me to mention that they are looking for members for their subcommittee. Uh, and again, their, their uh, charge is uh, includes uh, creating governance materials and standards to assist COSA uh, members in navigating the government information management decision-making process and to identify appropriate archives participation. Uh, they're, they're developing a framework uh, for a path forward for improvement for individual states and um, they're heavily involved with um, uh, the PERTS portal and continuing to enhance the resources available on the PERTS portal. And that reminds me that they also asked that they're always, asked me to mention that they're always looking for new electronic resources to be added to the PERTS portal. So if you know of a tool or policies, guidelines, standards, sample, job description, sample forms, et cetera, please submit them to the uh, PERDS portal. I will mention that you must be logged in to the website in order to submit a resource. You won't see that button to click to, to submit resources unless you are logged in. So if you have any questions, I encourage you to contact Alan or Nick and they can help you out there. Uh, please do. I, I'll echo Matt's um, suggestion to go on the website. Please do go on the website and uh, check out the PERDS portal. There's lots of great things um, available there. Uh, in conclusion, I want to thank everyone who is working on a SERI uh, subcommittee or committee or initiative and um, to remind everyone else to please contact the subcommittee co-chairs if you are interested in joining a subcommittee. Shelley, that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Next up we have John Dugan who is um, going to talk to us about the activities of the awards committee. Hopefully you can all hear me too. Okay, um, so we will start with talking about the upcoming, the, the awards that have upcoming deadlines of May the 1st. Um, we have the uh, Victoria Irons Walsh Leadership Award um, and the Travel Siphon, uh, both uh, that are, are, are named for, for our good longtime friend, Vicki Walsh. Um, and, and, and on all of these, uh, Ann always does a great job of sending out 
uh, email reminders, the deadlines for these, but I would encourage um, everyone, uh, we have so many deserving colleagues that I would encourage everyone to take the time to apply and uh, make sure that, that your coworkers, your staff members are up for consideration for these awards. Um, so, uh, so take the time. I've been on this committee for several years and take the time to recognize them. Last year we recognized Julia Marks Young for the Leadership Award and uh, Chris Denson, who I think now is at Oregon but was, was in another state uh, last year uh, with the Travel Award. Uh, the Advocacy for Archives Awards last year uh, went to, um, and we've already talked some about the NAS director and, the, and NASIO, but uh, to Leslie Reynolds, the executive director for NAS, and Doug Robinson, the executive director for NASIO, in recognition of their, um, uh, of, of their work that they're doing, too. So, uh, and then I believe it was our inaugural award last year for the Award of Merit that went to the state of New Mexico. Uh, last year, but I would encourage you all to uh, to uh, apply for these awards uh, and to um, to make sure that we have a good pool of applicants uh, to choose from for these again this year. Um, we've already actually had the deadline uh, for this year for the COSA Ancestry Leadership Award. We were very fortunate in the request that we had for this year um, to be able to award three groups of those. Uh, for various training, and I think it's really um, it's really unique in seeing the kinds of training that we were able to provide with this award. Uh, the state of North Carolina had two staff members, Kelly Eubank and Jeremy Gibson, who uh, applied and received funding toward internal project management that their state um, provides uh, at a fee, and so they were able to stay in state and pursue that training uh, for a major electronic records project they're working on in that state. Uh, Christina uh, Garrett uh, from Georgia um, got $500 toward uh, her participation at the Archives Leadership Institute, and it's going to be held this year in Kentucky, this coming year in Kentucky. And, and then two recipients from Alaska received, uh, Karen Gray and Chris, and I don't know how to say his last name, but I think it's Eve, um, uh, $1,000 towards going to the IPRES. Conference. So, if you can see in that, we've given money for things, everything from project management there internally in the state uh, to attendance at the IPRESS conference. So, uh, so I would just again encourage you to, as you see those emails, uh, don't wait and say I'm going to get to that, you know, next day or the next week or whatever. But, uh, but invest in uh, your your colleagues in nominating them for these awards. That's all I have to report. Thanks, John. Uh, next up, we have Trisha Smith Mansfield from Utah talking about um, the Development Committee and their activities. Trisha, are you there? Uh oh. <sighs> Trisha, are you there? Yeah. So I'm pushing the. Oh. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, good. I was, so I am filling in for Sandy Treadwell, who actually is the leader of the development committee, and also serving on the committee are Susan Lugo, Steve Excel, and Steve Murray. So the first on the item is the annual appeals, which is just finished up. We had two appeals this year and raised 7,000, if only we raised 70,000, 7,064 dollars. This is for the Walsh Leadership Award, the Reserve and General Operating Funds. That's a 16% increase over what we budgeted, so it was a good appeals campaign. We'd like to thank everyone who contributed and encourage all those that there's still time to contribute because we will be continuing the appeal in 2016, and we're grateful for all those who contribute. In corporate sponsorship, we continue to nurture our corporate sponsors and cultivate new ones who works, whose work dovetails with the COSA's missions and interests. Our current sponsorship is with Ancestry, who's on today's call, and will support the work session lunch and meeting at the annual meeting, the COSA, leadership, the COSA Ancestry Leadership Award, and ongoing programming. Family Search is another sponsor who supports our annual awards program 
Apex Axiom Software, who will be supporting our annual meeting member activities this year in Atlanta, and Gaylord Archival, who supports annual meeting activities, including the silent auction. The silent auction is a wonderful activity that we have in the annual meeting. We've had it for, I think, this will be the third annual year. Last year, the auction raised more than $1,200 to support programming. So we'd like you to start now thinking about things and items or services you can donate for the upcoming silent auction. Our work with this case in sustainability has been in collaboration with the Finance Committee, so this is kind of a another reinforcement on the case for sustainability. It answers the questions of what our dues support. It uh, draws on COSA's history and its goals and aspirations for the future. This will require board review and approval, and we will be having the proposal discussion with membership at the annual meeting this summer. So that's it for the Development Committee. Thanks, Tricia. Uh, I guess I'm up next. I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about what's going on with the Program Committee and uh, give a shout out to Lisa Prince, Lisa Spear, Jesse Brown, and John Metz who are part of the Program Committee and, and help make the webinars work. And then uh, um, Danya and Ann and uh, Becky also just great help with, with the Program Committee. The member webinars take place every fourth Thursday from January to October. And we've got another one coming up uh, February 25th, and that's the Shrab Town Hall. And Kathleen Williams and Dan Stokes will be joining us next month to talk about the activities of uh, NHPRC and Shrab. Uh, for the full lineup of the upcoming uh, webinars, you can go out to the New Costa website and I believe click on Programs. And there it is, Costa Webinar Series. So you can get a, get the full lineup and all of the dates for the upcoming webinars. The program committee is also working on their work plan, their annual work plan of other projects that the program committee might like to undertake this year. And so there is the possibility that um, someone from the program committee will be in touch with the members as we go about planning our activities and trying to get some feedback from the members on, on how to proceed on some of the projects that we have in mind. So you might be hearing from some of us in the next couple of months. But we are just busy and we've got a full slate ahead on the on the webinars. I can't encourage you enough to, to take advantage of these these webinars. So hopefully we'll see you in the next next month. I think we are um, we've got plenty of time for um, questions and answers. If you want to, I believe, type in in the chat section if, if you've got a question. Or in the Q&A, either or one works. Okay, thanks. I don't really see anything coming in, Shelley. I don't either. Maybe we just did such a great job of explaining everything that nobody <laughs> has any questions. <laughs> so if hearing none, um, we're going to take um, a quick pause before we start the Ancestry session. So for those of you who have to um, uh, get off the line right now because of procurement reasons, um, and then just a quick pause, and then we'll have uh, Jared Ackenhead and Brian Peterson join us from Ancestry. I'll just put in the quick plug of don't forget to, um, like Shelley said, check the list of upcoming um, webinars as well as don't forget we do do the evaluation after each webinar, so please watch for that if you are logging out at this time. Thank you.
Okay, I think I think we're ready to go with the ancestry presentation. Yep. Thanks, Jelly. Jared and Brian, are you there? righty. Yes. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Go ahead. All right. We are excited to take just a minute. Um, we're ahead of time, and we'll try to not uh, make up for that by being long-winded ourselves. But uh, Brian Peterson here with uh, Jared Aikenhead, Craig Bolo, and Quentin Atkinson on, on our side. You Most of you know us, and we're just really delighted to have a few minutes to just recap a, a great year we've had and, and looking forward to another great year in our association with COSA. So, um, just wanted to take a quick uh, couple of minutes and, and go through a few slides. Uh, we have uh, had a great year with our National Probate Project. Uh, most all of you are familiar with that. It was a big success, uh, very exciting uh, for us to be able to bring this body of records out and make it available to family history researchers and to uncover this from the archives in coordination with Family Search. Uh, we had a lot of media and a lot of really positive um, coverage around the, the probate record. And it was a really, just a fun thing for people to, to dig in and find a lot of great information. Had a lot of uh, success stories and a lot of things that, uh, that we heard out of this. Uh, we also um, want to just cover, it was a really big deal for us. This was a project that was over 170 million images, which was our largest uh, product release or content release as far as number of images goes that we have ever had at Ancestry. And so it really was a, a big deal that, uh, that we put a lot of resources, a lot of effort into and really enjoyed uh, being a part of that. Uh, we did cover all 50 states. We were a um, short Virginia, but we were able to put up records from all of the other states in, uh, in this release, which was a, a huge nationwide effort. Uh, and for that, we just wanted to say thank you to everybody who helped us, who worked with us in coordinating those efforts on local levels, on state levels, and again, a, a call out to Family Search who was a, a great partner and, and uh, help. We couldn't have done it certainly without them and, and just really had a good, uh, good experience in this project. We wanted to also go through, we've had some questions come up and, and some things that have been asked of us regarding the project and understanding a little bit more. So just want to take a quick minute to talk through uh, some misunderstandings and maybe some uh, questions. So we had, uh, questioned what exactly is the index and it is limited at this point to name and basic information on the deceased person and we just due to the the huge nature of the project uh, the cost and things associated uh, we limited our indexing to the will books case files and letters of administration um, will more be coming yes uh, we do have ongoing efforts in conjunction with uh, with Family Search to do additional indexing on the names and try to get as many of those individual names in the record uh, available and indexed as possible. So currently it is not an every name index to everyone in the record. That is a massive project, uh, but we do have that as a goal going forward and, and we'll be continuing to work going forward in that direction. Uh, we do um, have deliveries for those records forthcoming that are beginning now. Uh, some of you have been contacted. Uh, the rest of you who are scheduled to receive uh, deliveries will be asked uh, about the format, which is one of two ways, uh, J2K high resolution or a bitonal TIFF image, uh, which is a much smaller uh, storage size there really is virtually not a lot of difference just looking at it uh, on screen. It's pretty indistinguishable. It's just a matter of whether or not you're looking for a high resolution copy of that or a uh, more of a visual copy that uh, you can have and, and keep that uh, can be a lot smaller and easier to store. Um, we are not done with the probate project. It is an ongoing project. Uh, we have agreed with Family Search to work together to continue to aggregate records 
So additional probates from the state and local levels, as they're identified, will be imaged by Family Search. We will continue to create indexes for original record stats. And so please contact us or Family Search if you are aware of or have records that uh, are you're interested or others are interested in adding to the probate collection. Uh, just quickly, building on the success of the National Marriage uh, Probate Project, we are looking to do a similar kind of thing with the county marriage records. And so we recognize the marriage records come in a lot of different uh, forms. Some states have them only at the county level, and many of those have never been digitized or indexed or preserved in any way. Uh, many states have not aggregated marriage records um, prior to the statewide vital rec registrations, which some states have statewide registration for marriages, some states don't. And so we recognize that there are just a, a variety of sources, and what we're trying to do is to aggregate all of the marriage records that we can, uh, work with states who may have uh, ends with the counties to get those records digitized or preserved in some way, and to be able to just provide a large body of, of marriage records that is fairly comprehensive for the entire country. Um, and so we would love your help in, in preserving those records and, and getting those available. So again, if you know of records or have records, uh, and we'll be contacting you uh, as we go through, but if you have any of those that you're aware of, we'd love to, to hear from you. Um, again, just wrapping up, a great year last year in 2015. Uh, at, at Ancestry with a lot of uh, different initiatives that we began. Our Ancestry DNA has really taken off and, and been hugely popular in, in the family history world. Uh, we were able to sell about a million DNA kits in 2015, making Ancestry DNA the largest consumer DNA database in the world. Um, and as we add those uh, tests to the to the pool that we have, we're able to continue to refine ethnicity and genetic connections and do a lot of things that really facilitate people in being able to break through brick walls and, and find success um, in new ways in their family history research. Uh, we also had some new products and offerings, Ancestry Academy, which is a learning format uh, for genealogy and, and ancestry. Uh, we had uh, something called New Ancestor Discoveries which is connected to the DNA, helping, again, identify in roundabout and different new ways uh, ancestors for folks that they may not have been able to find before, and Ancestry Health, which is a, a whole new field in helping look at people's background and genealogy and using that to help them to create um, a picture of some of the different health aspects of, of their selves and their, their ancestors. Um, our television show uh, sponsorships continue. Finding Your Roots Season 3 is in progress, and we will be having new seasons upcoming of Who Do You Think You Are and Genealogy Roadshow, so look for those announcements this spring. And uh, with that, I just wanted to turn the time over to Jared for just a couple minutes to talk about one other thing that uh, we've been doing for a few years, but many of you may not know about, called Ancestry Day. So Jared, take it away. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I won't be uh, too long on this. Um, some of you may be aware of this uh, event that we've put on. Um, we've done this for, like Brian said, a few years now, um, where uh, we hold a uh, what we call an Ancestry Day in conjunction with uh, uh, those of uh, some of our partners who are interested in bringing additional awareness to some of the resources uh, for the, in their facility and local areas. Um, and so we put these on uh, three or four times a year um, in conjunction with, uh, with I said, some of those uh, uh, partners that we have content from. And um, uh, we do this at, uh, at, at no cost uh, in terms of the uh, resources that we provide. Um, and it's a collaborative effort between us and uh, the institutions that we work with. Um, the typical costs are around 30 to $40 for registration, and we, we send out the email blasts to all of our users and, uh, and, and bring in those registrations and, and manage that. Um, and uh, you know, the, the local institutions, along with their staff and volunteers, are responsible for perhaps providing a venue and some other uh, administrative type uh, of duties there. 
we find it's a really a great event to hold um, to bring um, folks together uh, who are interested in family history um, and to learn more about, like I said, the resources available uh, not only locally uh, in the area but also specifically, you know, in, into uh, the, the archives or other institutions that we've partnered with. Like I said, this costs typically around thirty to forty dollars. We like to keep it at a, at a fairly minimum. It's a Friday Saturday event. Uh, we've held one uh, recently in North Carolina. Uh, that was a great success as well. Um, the typical attendance is somewhere between 700 and 1,000 participants over those days. Um, and if you want to do the math on that in terms of uh, the revenue that could potentially generate, um, if you, you know, m multiply that by $40, uh, potentially there's uh, some revenue to be gained by, by the partner. Uh, like I said, we, we don't take any of that and we pass it all over to the institutions we partner with. Uh, so that they can, uh, you know, benefit financially from from that sort of event. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, you can contact uh, one of us, Brian, myself, or Craig, uh, to learn a little bit more about uh, what's required of that, or speak with some of those institutions uh, that have already held those events. Um, I'll get the next slide there. Um, and just as a quick example, a couple of photos from a recent, the recent uh, Ancestry Day. We held in North Carolina um, there with the, uh, uh, the North Carolina State Archives. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share that with you once again. We're really happy to, to, to be a part of this organization, to continue our sponsorship there, um, and uh, we appreciate everyone's time and understanding. If there's anything we can do as an organization for any of your institutions, please don't hesitate to reach out to, to, to us, and um, we, we'd like to engage with you on, on anything we can. Thank you so much, Brian and Jared. That looks like a huge crowd <laughs> in North Carolina. Um, it really we was, and it's been a huge success for those that have, have held those, so. Super, so um, we actually are moving ahead of time, so we have time if anybody who is on with us actually has any questions for either Jared or Brian, we actually have time to do a Q&A with Ancestry as well. So either on Ancestry Day or um, the project that they've just finished up, it, here's your chance. <laughs> so we'll see if any, if that's all right, we'll see if any questions come in for you. Um, give folks a little bit of a chance here to type something in. Maybe, maybe not. Some days things are quieter than others. <laughs> um, so Sarah does have a question. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the DNA program and the connection with health information? So this is an area that is, is really quite new. Uh, what we're doing is looking at the opportunities for right now is primarily being able to go through your family history and identify different um, diseases or health issues that your ancestors had and and it's not necessarily tied directly to the um, DNA side of it but we have done some partnering with some organizations I don't know if any of you are familiar with Calico which is a division of Google, and they are working in a business-to-business -business partnership with uh, Ancestry Health in trying to develop some of those kinds of, of connections and things. Uh, right now, the, the beta for Ancestry Health is, is primarily you identifying your ancestors and their health issues, and then using uh, research and things to then calculate the kinds of concerns, uh, possibilities, and things that you may have for your own health. Um, there's a longevity study that is going due to or to look at causes of, of death of your ancestors and then try to identify through genetics some of those uh, genes and what uh, those may mean looking at your ancestors and how that may affect you. So there's a whole lot. It's a brand new area and, and just beginning in a lot of ways, but uh, looking forward to uh, a lot of that research and, and those things connecting going forward uh, in ways that will more and more draw the 
ancestry and, and genealogy side of things together with the DNA and some of the research and studies. So hopefully that helps. Um, not super technical because it's not necessarily my area of expertise, but uh, it is super interesting the, the direction things are going. Oh, that's uh, a good enough answer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then also, uh, just real quick, um, one of our members was wondering if she could have her slides. I believe she came in a little late. If we could share your slides with her. Um, I would be more than happy to send my slides to Barbara, absolutely. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then um, we've got Matt with a question, and I'm trying to unmute Matt, and I'm not having much luck. Becky, can you unmute Matt? Matt had his hand up. <laughs> oh, Matt says his question has been answered. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, I don't see any other questions. So thank you very much, Brian and Jared. Always appreciated. Always interesting and new things that you have going on. So um, I want to wrap up today with the usual things that we wrap up with. We really do appreciate your feedback. Um, the way that the program committee helps decide on a theme for the coming year is through your feedback on the webinar evaluation. So please, if there are topics um, or ideas that you have for webinars, please share them. We do read your comments, and we really do appreciate your feedback. Um, so after you exit the webinar, you'll be automatically taken to the online webinar evaluation. It's not very long, so please take a couple of minutes to fill it out. Your voice is heard. Um, so again, don't forget, we have a lot of upcoming webinars. Um, our usual Shrab Town Hall in February. And then in March, we start in with our themed webinars for the year, which are all on collaboration. And so in March, we'll have a um, presentation on collaborating for advocacy. Um, with that joint advocacy committee, advocacy committee that Sarah was talking about. Um, in April, we'll talk about building and working with partnerships. May, we'll talk about funding collaborations, and then in June, collaborations with K through 12 schools. So we hope that there's going to be something of interest for everybody coming up this year. And again, um, we're still continuing, as um, Mike said, with the COSA Preservica digital preservation webinars. So be sure to sign up for email archiving. I know that just makes my head spin when I think about it. Um, and then we are doing a repeat of the practical digital preservation modules one and two, which are kind of the foundations um, for the uh, rest of the one hour webinars. Oh, and we do, I somehow missed um, a question. I'm sorry, I didn't see it come up, um, Jim, in the... Uh, q and A. I'm, how very strange. Um, we did actually have a question for you, Brian and Jared. Jim had a question. Um, uh, was just curious why Virginia wasn't included in the probate project. Sure, I can answer that. I, I think the basic reason is is there was some uh, delays in getting some approvals um, uh, through the uh, the library and the. Uh, relationship they had with the counties uh, involving an agreement uh, that was had many years ago. <laughs> we were trying to work through that uh, agreement, some of the nuances of that agreement that would allow us to, to include records uh, that were at the counties um, into that project. But unfortunately, that never occurred at this point um, in time for us to release anything uh, in, in this project. We're, we're certainly hopeful that we can um, uh, get that accomplished in the in the future. We'd love to add, add those records, but at this time, we're kind of restricted uh, in doing so until we can um, uh, until we can overcome that that small legal hurdle. Ah, uh, thank you very much. Oh, now for some reason the question showed up in Q and A for me. Oh, 
Okay, so again, a huge, um, huge, huge thank you to our sponsors. Um, each year, our corporate sponsorships provide critical funding support for many of COSA membership activities and events, as we've heard. Um, we are especially grateful to Ancestry.com and our other corporate sponsors featured here, Family Search, Preservica, Gaylord Archival, and Apex Software. Support for COSA's program initiatives is also generously provided by grants from NHPRC and IMLS. So, um, and as a final note, please don't forget to stay connected. Um, check out our new website if you haven't. We are still happily taking any comments and suggestions that you might have. Um, also keep up with us on Facebook and Twitter. So thank you everybody for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you on next month's COSA member webinar. Thank you. And thank you again, Jared and Brian.